So I'm Wendy Mayer. I'm professor at ALC and also Dean of Research Strategy for the University of Divinity. And it's my pleasure to be introducing Associate Professor Daryl Jackson. Daryl grew up in the Isle of Man and has subsequently lived in the UK, Hungary, and since 2012 has lived in Sydney. He's an ordained Baptist minister and graduated with a doctorate of theology from the University of Birmingham in 2009. Daryl has served in church and regional ministry and was the national mission advisor to the Baptist Union of Great Britain from 1996 until 2003. He served as executive researcher for the Conference of European Churches, Geneva, and became the founding director of the Nova Research Centre and lecturer in European Mission, Redcliffe College, England, and in early 2012 was appointed a senior lecturer in missiology at Morling College in Sydney. In mid-2019, he was appointed to his current role at Whitley College at the University of Divinity as director of research. Daryl is currently supervising PhD candidates from Chinese, Sri Lankan, Australian and Nigerian backgrounds. He served as adjunct and visiting faculty at Bristol Baptist College, Regents Park College in Oxford, Tabor College in Adelaide, and the International Baptist Theological Seminary in Prague. And pre-COVID, he was a regular conference speaker and is of course continuing to write. He is a Mission Commission Associate of the WEA, a member of the Commission for Mission of the Baptist World Alliance, a member of the International Association of Mission Studies, sits on the Missiological Advisory Committee of Global Interaction, the Australian Baptist Mission Agency, and is a member of the International Board of European Christian Mission International. So in case you haven't worked out already, uh, his primary research area is missiology. He's recently completed the third edition of Mapping Migration in Europe, published by the World Council of Churches. And of relevance to today's paper, he has more recently written a chapter on Baptist expressions of diaconia for the International Handbook of Ecumenical Diaconia, published this year by Regnum Fortress. His paper today is the Diaconia Day, Service of the World and Forms of Diaconal Ministry Among Baptists. Please welcome Daryl. Thank you, Wendy. I think uh, research conferences, indeed any conferences, are great um, and I'm sure that like me you enjoy being at them. The content um, of those sessions, sometimes you can leave it, sometimes it's great, sometimes uh, it's not so great, uh, but of course it's the real, the real value is always found in the networking um, and the relationships that you build over coffee or tea or something else. Um, yeah, do you remember that? Uh, so I miss that. I miss that networking and the opportunity to really chew over ideas that are thrown out in these sessions. But I think despite that, um, I would always encourage uh, particularly early career researchers to frequent conferences like this one. Um, and uh, it's enabled me to develop a body of uh, my own writings, um, particularly before I've discovered that somebody else has already written about it. Um, and I think it's good to write when you are at your most provocative and self-confident um, and uh, believing it will save you in good stead later in your academic career. I make this point partly because what I want to do throughout the paper is to just reflect on my own process of writing this paper. I hope that that's helpful for some of you at least. Um, wondering how you deal with your own file of unpublished jottings and conference papers that you've presented before. How do you put those to good use? And um, I also, of course, hope that my work today leads to the eventual creation of an era rated monograph. Um, I've never been afraid to put my ideas out there. They may be been wrong at times, but I think they've helped the development of my own thinking and reflection. From time to time, I've also found it helpful to intentionally overstate my case, adopting a form of hyperbole as a rhetorical device to stimulate constructive and sometimes destructive peer engagement and uh, review. So let me uh, quickly set today's uh, paper in a broader context. This sits in a sequence of um, ongoing work, the first of which um, was published in 2013 which looked at the intersection of service and authority as displayed in the ministry of Jesus, particularly as a fulfillment of messianic promise, uh, with particular reference to 
uh, passage there in Mark chapter 10. Uh, the second uh, piece was the, that which Wendy has just referred to, which explores the possibility of a diaconal ministry of pastoral service that's radically covenantal, re reoriented towards the service of the world, and which reconceives service at the table of the Lord as a location for serving and inviting into the covenant community those who are, quote, out of relationship. That was published earlier this year. And in this paper today, I'm trying to develop a Trinitarian, hence theological and missional exposition of the Diaconia, Diaconia Dei. Um, and I hope that this is an encouragement to those of you who are wrestling with um, your own work, noting that the first of these appeared in 2013, uh, itself a culmination of a number of years of wrestling with themes of service and ministry and mission. And uh, of course, this paper today sits some um, eight years or so later and it's still an ongoing work. Uh, sometimes these ideas take a long time to generate and to emerge. So what problem is my work today addressing? And I make these points um, here in uh, overview and then deal with them each in turn in more detail. Firstly, I believe that among Baptists particularly, diaconal ministries are significantly under-theologized and an increasingly invisible practice. And secondly, many aspects of diaconal ministry, particularly again amongst Baptists, fail to win consensus, and that this in turn portends the death of the deacon. So what are some of those areas where there seems to be a lack of consensus? Let me deal with these uh, initially. Lack of consensus amongst Baptists around whether there are two offices of ministry or three. There is a lack of consensus around whether the diaconal ministry is open to both males and females, whether deacons should be ordained, commissioned or appointed. There was a lack of consensus around how to prioritize the range of understandings and practices of diaconal ministry. There was a lack of consensus around whether ministers or ministry are an ecclesiological necessity. It was of the essay of the church. There was a lack of consensus around the nature of ministry and its relationship to the office of the deacon as minister. There is a lack of consensus around the relative value of biblical texts for any intertextual account of diaconia and diaconal ministry. Some of you might say, yeah, well, that's Baptist for you. <laughs> um, but it is a reality that this is indeed um, on view. And uh, this uh, brief summary um, summarizes about six pages of discussion in my first draft of today's paper, which gladly you'll be Pleased to hear I won't um, force upon you. Um, amongst Baptist diaconal ministry is under theologized, and this lack of consensus, I think, betrays that fact. Um, where diaconal studies have been undertaken but amongst Baptists, these have generally been confined to biblical studies of key New Testament passages, studies of the use of passages in historical debates and how these have used and made reference to those same. New Testament passages, more particularly a range of how-to manuals of contemporary diaconal practice, which collectively might be considered to have resulted in attenuated forms of diaconal ministry resting on the apparently solid foundations of thin biblical ice, inadequately theological, borrowing a veneer of historical credibility through the consistent repetition and accretion of our various confessional statements. Extended discussions of diaconal ministry are largely absent from texts dealing with self-consciously Baptist approaches to the doing of theology. They're absent in Baptist studies on worship, absent in texts on Baptist distinctives and identity, absent in Baptist texts on mission. They do not feature in Baptist accounts of Catholicity, covenant, nor inter-Christian dialogue. And yet Baptists would often pride themselves on the fact that they are a movement of peoples that have deacons at the heart of their practices of ministry. Now, that diaconal ministry amongst Baptists may be a common point of confession. Across a wide range of Baptist confessions of faith, the offices of ministry remain relatively consistent and understood as twofold largely. However, 
The diaconal ministry of pastoral service remains massively underdeveloped in these confessions. As the corpus of literature is widened to include commentary and theological reflection on the various confessions and statements of faith, the, re the reader is faced with an overwhelming sense of diversity rather than coherence of either definition or practice. This paper represents my attempt to summarize some of that diversity of understanding of practice, highlight the problems inherent in the diversity, and propose a roadmap towards a constructive theological and biblical account of diaconal ministry. In the light of that diversity, how do Baptists generally summarize their positions? Well, many Baptist authors claim to be using the language of deacon or diaconate with a Baptist accent. The important work of Haynes, Goulburn and Cross, three British Baptist authors writing together, describe the diaconate as a form of structural ministry that exists for practical and that exists for the tasks of practical oral activity commissioned within and for a congregation. Now, my summary of the evidence above suggests that their assessment is actually fairly accurate, but perhaps rather disappointing. In that, it prompts the need, I believe, for a more constructive and imaginative theology that better informs and resources the diaconal ministry of pastoral service into and for the world, not for the church alone. Biblical and theological reflection that has been hitherto developed remains largely that of a diaconia ecclesiae that fails in equipping the ecclesia to engage the contemporary oikonomia. This is properly the ministry of the diaconoi, each instance of this being a contextual rendering of the ministry of the diaconus domus, Jesus, the son of Mary, carpenter of Nazareth, Lord and Messiah, son of man, the suffering servant. My research question that follows then is, is it possible to imagine a theology of the diaconia day that catalyzes the co-location of diaconia in some measure with liturgia and martyria, worship witness, in a way that resources a constructive theology of Baptist diaconal ministry in service of the world. Now, in order to do that, I try and identify what I describe as three trajectories of service amongst Baptists. And for the sake of this presentation, I will not discuss either the first or the third, although I'll present them here briefly in review. And uh, you'll see how these three um, are described. The first trajectory I describe as the diaconal ministry of pastoral service and Episcopal drift. And if you want to hear more about that, this essentially entails the singular development of ministry and of minister as an appropriation into the Episcopal ministry of pastoral oversight. This is what I The third trajectory, again, the third which I will not discuss, is a more recent development of theologies of the diaconal ministry um, and is better suited, uh, uh, well, one rather, which appears in a missional and liturgical, liturgical context, but these are, as I say, yet underdeveloped. And it's this second trajectory that I wish to focus on, which I describe here as the diaconal ministry, a pastoral, ministry, pastoral service and leadership shift. This I think probably is likely to have uh, greater relevance to a wider number of people with interest in this contemporary expression of Christian ministry and the use of leadership discourse. element of my presentation. If diaconal ministry has been susceptible to the gradual usurpation of diaconia by the Episcopal ministry, and this second trajectory supposes that diaconal ministry has been impacted by the sudden and dramatic professionalization of ministry and the adoption of a requisite leadership discourse to inform and shape these new practices. Now, of course, it's possible that in some instances, the course of leadership discourse and the Episcopal usurpation are actually inseparably intertwined. Tom Torrance writes about the constant temptation for the church, quote, not only to institutionalize its service of the divine mercy, but to build up power structures of its own, 
He wrote that in 1966. Of course, there are elements of this to be welcomed. Torrance concedes that the temptation is commonly faced in the effort to increase the efficient delivery of caring services or to respond to the way perhaps that regulatory frameworks require such moves. However, and again, there is a certain irony to this. It has been the Episcopal ministries of pastoral oversight that appear to have most enthusiastically embraced the metaphor of leadership and jettisoned their sister ministries of service in the apparent cause of securing increased ecclesial and missional efficiency and productivity. Now it is a simple fact that the use of leadership discourse by the churches is virtually unknown before 1900. This might shock some of the listeners, but it reflects the simple reality that leadership in its cognate form as a term did not exist prior to 1821. In the early 1820s, its use then was limited to describing the position or the command or the post of a leader. By the end of the 19th century, it was being applied to refer to the characteristics displayed by a leader. Now, the current bewildering range of leadership literature and the many models and metaphors described therein is symptomatic of the diverse range of meanings, models, and metaphors for leadership. So too are the demands upon leaders. These have changed from industrial to informational leadership. And so the preferred models and metaphors are tweaked, substituted, and replaced as necessary. I believe the consequences of an uncritical embrace of leadership metaphors remain largely unexamined within a Baptist context, maybe within some of those that you are also located. This is of particular concern given the extent to which leadership discourse and practices have displaced the discourse and practice of ministry, both pastoral and diaconal. A great number of Baptist churches and the associational bodies to which they belong have similarly embraced it. The adoption of CEO styles of leadership too readily obscure the essential character of the diaconal ministry as service and tend unhelpfully to accentuate or elevate those aspects of the Episcopal Office of Pastoral Oversight, which have always proven the most difficult to model with love and mercy, namely those of authority and rule. In a move that was not uncontroversial, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Baptists appointed Brian Winslade to the role of national leader in 2001. Such moves prompt questions as to when and why the wider Christian community began using the leadership metaphor, essentially that which rests on the terminology um, of guide or of drover, to describe those among them who had previously exercised ministries understood through the biblical metaphors of father, shepherd, witness, brother, sister, ambassador, etc. More particularly, when and where did the discourse of leadership enter Baptist ecclesiology and pastoral theology? My Nichols brief historical survey of, survey of ministry among Baptists makes a noticeable switch from ministry terminology to leadership terminology when he moves from its historical survey to from in his historical survey to a review of the contemporary practices of the 1980s. The emergence of leadership discourse is to be seen in, for example, the 1961 report prepared by the Council of the Baptist Union of Great Britain, the doctrine of the ministry. In section seven of that report, ministry as it is identified with the roles of apostle, teacher, pastor, evangelist, prophet. And the report uh, nominates these as leadership roles, which function to equip ministry among, from, and within the membership of the church. Baptist commentators tend to agree that the primary catalysts in the adoption of leadership terminology are on display in Baptist responses to the charismatic movement of the 1960s, the church growth movement of the 1970s, and the accompanying and wider social and political drift quotes of the 1980s. Indeed, several of these authors are themselves credited with contributing to the shift through their writings and observations of such moves. Martin Sutherland and Laurie Guy in New Zealand observe and record the adoption of, quote, apostolic approaches to leadership amongst the Baptists of Aotearoa in New Zealand during this period, and consider this in retrospect to have been an ecclesial innovation for Baptists in that country. <laughs> 
Leadership discourse was truly global by the 21st century and capitulation in the face of the inevitable seems to be on display even from those who were the staunchest defenders of inherited patterns of Baptist ministry. Published work over the 20th century suggests a massive fall off in mentions of church ministry over that century, ceding its dominance to mentions of church leadership by the 1970s. Now, as I said earlier, prior to 1900, there are no published mentions of church leadership by, uh, no published mentions of church leadership, yet by 2019, for every mention of church ministry, there are at least four mentions of church leadership in printed literature. Now, of course, correlation is not causation, but it's difficult not to believe these two trends are related in some way. And I depict them graphically using this engram, which charts the incidence of both of these two terms in literature from the Google Books repository. And you notice there that church leadership discourse passed massively from the discourse of church ministry around about the year, uh, well, certainly the late 1990s uh, is underway. Now, it may well be that uh, the extent to which leadership discourse is used uh, may itself be seen as a contextual accommodation. The 1961 report that I referred to just a moment ago notes that the New Testament church itself makes use of contextual leadership terminology and suggests that it's, quote, not wrong for the church to reflect the sociological patterns in which it bears its witness. Now, a reluctance to embrace the utility of rulers and ruled for understanding ministry may be apparent in the work of some Baptist writers. For example, Nigel Wright takes this stance, but also concedes the use of the metaphor of leadership is nevertheless contextual, drawn from business and management, and he accepts that New Testament patterns will be, quotes, adaptable to local customs and circumstance. Wright's position that all ministry is best understood through the lens of diaconia is actually close to my own view, yet I feel that his concession to the use of leadership terminology leads in reality to expressions with which I feel that he and I would both be vexed. For example, the usage of, uh, the uses by one Baptist author, uh, the language of strong biblical pastoral leadership language that is increasingly commonplace amongst Baptists. Whilst it's probably true that the recognition of leadership does not necessarily involve forsaking the relationship of service, it's unlikely that the 1961 Baptist Union Doctrine of the Ministry Report would have anticipated the extent to which diaconia as a prerequisite for the healthy witnessing of service uh, of, and service of the ecclesia has been eroded secularized and institutionalized over the succeeding half a century. Well, having given that brief uh, review of uh, one of the trajectories of service amongst Baptists, let me then turn to my attempt to begin to imagine what the elements of a constructive theology of diaconia amongst Baptists might look like. Let me immediately say that I would like to think this argument is complete, but it's far from it. Um, the reality is that um, what began life for this presentation as a 24 page text had to eventually be reduced down to a seven or so page text. Um, and even that 24 pages was inadequate to carry um, the argument that I wish to sustain. And so there are elements where uh, there is yet further work to be developed. But at some point, recognizing that every um, presentation uh, probably in this conference is being produced by somebody who is um, drawn in many different directions, uh, busy, and so just the life of a busy researcher means at some point you just have to stop. You don't finish, you just stop. And so this uh, part of my paper uh, stopped, and um, some of uh, these parts that are as yet, as yet undeveloped will perhaps appear in other chapters, uh, but uh, I share with you what I have um, uh, set, distilled down to these three points uh, for the purpose of this presentation. In this uh, final section, I want to suggest the promise of a constructive theology of Dekania. I want to then show the move from 
what I characterize as a diaconia ecclesiae to diaconia dei, and thirdly, to move that conversation in alignment with martyria and liturgia to suggest the need for witnessing service in every place. This is where I hope. The promise of a constructive theology of diaconia is, I believe, on view in the work of British Baptist author Stephen Winderwood, who in the 1960s, with his typical literary flair, um, described and discusses church as diaconia, mission, and priesthood. And I also take my lead from uh, somewhat related work, albeit um, a more ecumenical work, the um, piece of work that was prepared for Karl Barth's 80th birthday, The Service of Christ. And in that book, um, we find ref I find reference to the interdependence of diaconia, liturgia, and martyria, and take my lead from those, believing that this, these lend themselves to a constructive theology of diaconia, albeit always contextual. And this becomes an important point of reference for me as a missiologist, trying to understand the nature of diaconia in each and every context. In my chapter from the International Handbook of Ecumenical Diaconia, I do reflect on the implications of the simple observation that whereas it's been possible for other Christian traditions to direct the, di the, the diaconate towards the service of the world, that may be both either in practice or at least confessionally, uh, for Baptists, it has largely remained a ministry role to which individuals are, are appointed from within the congregation for service within the congregation. It's for these and related reasons that some Baptists have come to view the diaconate as discredited or irrelevant, an irrelevant aspect of a local church that is determined to grow and to multi multiply. Inadequacies of the Baptist conception of the deacon are evidence of a failure to understand that the service or the diaconia for which they have been set aside is not an office in the gift of the church, hence defined by it, but it is a consequence of the essential nature of God. Acknowledging this signals the theologically necessary move from the, the language of diaconia ecclesia to diaconia dei. Attempts to flesh out what this latter concept might mean are evident in the work of South African theologian Hannes Knetzer, who locates Diaconia Dei, Trinitatis, at the center of his understanding of transformational development. Using Trinitarian theology to describe the Father obliging fallen humanity to mutual care and the stewardship of creation. The Father sending the Son as deacon to live out his Diaconia, and his Holy Spirit empowering the deacons and believers for Diaconia. Diaconal responsibility finds its foundation for Knutzer in the being of the creator God. Now, of course, the embrace of Trinitarian theology is not without its dangers, and John Flett uh, reminds us of some of those dangers in his own work on the Missio Dei. For some, this can become too abstract. Yet, I believe there is some benefit to be drawn from the work of theologians, Baptist and otherwise, and I make particular reference here to the work of Baptist theologian Stephen Holmes and his reliance upon Trinitarian theology to elucidate a Baptist theology of ordained ministry. Now, of course, ordained ministry is not my particular interest here, but I find his methodology suggestive nevertheless. Holmes's discussion of ordination to ministry amongst Baptists is framed with a careful and explicit Trinitarian theology. Holmes is concerned to maintain an appropriate emphasis upon the ministry exercised by the congregation while sim simultaneously endorsing the ordained role of the minister. He references the undivided works of the Trinity and the extent to which recent free church ecclesiology has made use of the relational life of the Trinity, sounding as he does so the warning of modalism uh, the danger of uh, warning the, of the danger of modalism in doing so. 
However, Holmes is more than aware that an adequate Trinitarian theology will allow for proper distinctions in the work of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, respectively, initiation, operation, and perfection, where St. Basil of Caesarea's way of, suggest, of suggesting proper distinctions in the work variously attributed to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. However, Holmes remind us, reminds us that this is one work, not three, and proper distinctions may never become improper divisions. Now, there is a parallel argument to be made in this respect, I believe, that the diaconia of the Son is the same diaconia as that of the Spirit, for example. There is only one diaconia, for this is an expression of God's self. Likewise, it can be argued that the diaconia of the entire congregation is the same diaconia that is offered by those set aside for the diaconal ministry of pastoral service. There may be practices of the laos, the people of God, that enable them to serve, and which are distinct from the practices of the diaconoi, that enable them to serve. But these are together the one work of diaconia, for it is the service of the one God that they offer. That is a, not a practice of service that is of their own genesis. According to Holmes, the doctrine of appropriation extends and deepens his insistence upon proper distinction without improper division. This permits primacy of role within the undivided act to be appropriated to Father, Son, and Spirit, yet without division. If the doctrine of appropriation has utility for ecclesiology, it enables, again, I believe, similar, similar claims to be explored regarding the, quote, proper distinctions that exist between diaconia, liturgia, and martyria, even while these may not be improperly divided, for they are interdependent expressions of that which the church has received and experienced as charism. Drawing together one line of inquiry in his argument for the Diaconia de Trinitatis for transformational development, Knutzer claims that Diaconia belongs to the being of God and therefore belongs to the being of the church. If this is so, then there are significant implications for the way that diaconal ministry must be prepared to accommodate itself to creative, uh, accommodate itself in creative and possibly tensive ways. If pastoral oversight and leadership exist in tension with or as distinct to diaconal ministry, the latter must still deal with the question of authority that is raised by the concurrence of diaconia, liturgia, and martyria. I'll return to that theme a short while. Holmes recognizes that if ministry is part of the ministry of the church, which is in turn a participation through the Holy Spirit in the ministry of Christ received from the Father, then both the triune God and the church have authority over the ministry. I think Holmes is right in this respect. For this reason, any exercise of diaconal ministry as a reflection of the diaconia dei if it is to be extended as witnessing service, we'll need to recognize that the church's witness to all peoples comes in the same package as authority. In fact, Torrens suggests that the curios diaconos dynamic is the basis for the diaconal office. As diaconus domos, Christ is exemplar. As curios, Christ is commissioner, Lord. And it is the spirit who bestows the charisma for the diaconal, diaconal ministry of pastoral service. Now, I have to confess that I'm not always sure I navigate well the interrelated ministry requirements of service and authority. But I believe this becomes a necessary consequence of, under, of extending the understanding and practice of the diaconal ministry of pastoral service with reference to selfless witness in other words, the martyria of diaconia. And so let me move my discussion of diaconal ministry as pastoral service uh, into a more 
obviously missiological concept. Here I talk about the witnessing, the witness of service or witnessing service in each and every place. I believe it's worth speculating about the extent to which diaconia, at the very least, informs one of the first moments of witness to the ministry of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 12, the account of the baptism of Jesus, John the Baptist appears as servant, even as perhaps as a slave, doulos where he says, I am not even worthy to carry his shoes. It's the role of the servant or the slave. John the Baptist then baptizes Jesus as servant, anticipated by Isaiah, Isaiah Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, referencing Isaiah 40, verse 3. And consequently, John offers his first witness to the Messiah, verses 11 and 12. A Messiah who will, quote, baptize with fire. And if indeed it is the servant that baptizes the servant, then there is possibly the allusion here to a servant who will baptize with fire in like manner to the attitude in which John baptized, but with heavenly authority in the symbol of fire. Now, if my reading of this passage has any merit, it lends weight to my contention that diaconia might be the primary move in mission or witnessing service. This need not surprise, for the apostolate is itself described by Luke in Acts chapter 1 verse 25 as diaconia, itself a reflection of the service of Jesus of Nazareth, foot washing moments, for example, in John chapter 13. Now, of course, messianic service is not limited to a singular act of foot washing in the Gospels. It was expected that the servant, messianic servant, would undertake a range of services or ministries. The question for the Gospel writers to consider was, I believe, if Jesus of Nazareth truly was the Messiah, or Christos, which of those acts of service are we to record which bear adequate witness to his being the messianic servant? As risen servant and Corios, Jesus commissions his disciples to be servants. They themselves demonstrate this, uh, this act of servantship by baptizing other disciples from among the nations, Matthew 28, verse 19. In this moment, the servant and Corios acts through the Spirit, authoritatively in and through the disciples, sent as witnesses. Motores. His divine authority is requisite for their obedience in everything the Lord taught them. Matthew 28, verse 20. And of course, that to which they are called to be obedient is encapsulated in the great commandment of Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. Love the Lord your God, um, love your neighbor, etc. Of course, it's the only great that is referenced in Matthew 28, despite three centuries of insistence otherwise. These commandments involve the practice of diaconia liturgia in loving God and the practice of diaconia martoria in loving neighbor. Through their obedient service, the apostles come to embody the messianic authority as servants of all and thus bear authentic witness to the suffering servant as one who selfishly expends himself as Lord and Savior for the peoples of every nation. If my messianic service was not restricted to a singular act of foot washing and the service to which that act pointed was a prophetic incorporation of something perceived to be essential to the nature and action of God in the Hebrew Bible, then we can speculate about the extent to which the messianic service of Jesus is itself a contextual appropriation of those passages from Isaiah and elsewhere with reference to the incarnate Son of God, whose nature incorporates and expresses with that of the father, diaconia. If diaconia characterizes the public ministry of Jesus as Messiah, then we should anticipate that the early church will be so characterized. Diaconia and the diaconal ministry of pastoral service are clearly in view from the earliest chapters of the book of Acts, and they shape the gospels that are to be read among the congregations. Reading these texts inspires their own acts of service, which become a witness to the self-offering Jesus 
self-offering of Jesus for the redemption of peoples in every nation. Not only this, but the witness of their service does not go unnoticed by the secular, secular authorities, who in some places seek to replicate their charitable service. This service of the early church is offered by Laos and the diaconate elite alike. For all new, followers, all new followers of Jesus, the diaconus domus, are to serve in his name and with his authority. The service of the diaconal ministry of the early church is not intended, intended as a blueprint for those who exercise the diaconal office among Baptists today. Indeed, the service of Jesus as Messiah was unique in many ways, and the early church did not take this as their blueprint for their own practices of witnessing service as they traveled among the people of every nation. What they did nevertheless take from the gospels was the commission from Jesus to serve, the commission to diaconia. They exercised this diaconia through contextual practices of the diaconal ministry of service, which for this reason varied from place to place. They were all contextual expressions and they do not offer blueprints for today's deacon. The archetype or paradigmatic practice is diaconia, not diakonos. For the laos is also required to exercise diaconia from place to place and age to age. Those who exercise the diaconal ministry of pastoral service will do so in a variety of ways, each responsive to context. It's not diaconal diversity alone that renders inauthentic the ministry of the diaconoi, where it's exercised particularly as a genuine expression of diaconia. The authenticity of one or other expressions of diaconal ministry is only endangered in those instances where the diaconoi are tempted to exercise oversight or leadership, or conversely, where their own diaconal ministry is appropriated or misdirected by those who already exercise oversight or leadership. A deacon remains a deacon only in the measure to which they exercise diaconia. And so my interim conclusions, and I immediately um, qualify this by stating that these interim conclusions are purely for this research conference and um, the broader conclusions uh, for this particular piece of work um, draw upon the sections that I have not shared with, with you today. I want to suggest that Baptists today, for the large, in large measure, do not actually know what to do with the precious charism of the diaconal ministry as a vital expression of the diaconia dei. What I hope I've managed to outline here is, a, is there are the elements of a constructive account of mission as witnessing service, an expression of the diaconia dei, that offers the prospect of the missional and liturgical renewal of the diaconal ministry of pastoral service amongst Baptists. I've located the contemporary Baptist congregation on a contextual trajectory that references the Diaconia Dei Trinitatis, the texts of Isaiah, the service of Jesus the Messiah, the Diaconia of the early church, and my own Baptist tradition. I believe that the trajectory I have traced finds its eschatological point of arrival in the sobriquet, good and faithful doulos, good and faithful servant.